David. Evening everyone, lovely to see so many of you here. Uh, can you hear me or shall I, are we all right? Can you hear me at the back? Oh, they've gone to sleep already, no. Um, what I thought I'd do is just introduce the theme uh, for this evening with a few opinions, not necessarily mine, but also um, a few images too. Um, firstly, may I introduce Compton Verney, to which you've all been, haven't you? Who's been? Hands up. Good. Who's not been? Hands up. Right, we'll be taking names and addresses later on. We know where you live. This is our, well, semi-public rural art. Doesn't really count, but two wonderful pieces we've installed in the last couple of years in the uh, wonderful historic parkland at Compton Verde. This is by Faye Claridge, a massive rocking horse. These are two of our, uh, the images from our wonderful In Light Lighting Spectaculars. Um, funded now by the Arts Council, um, firstly by Laurent Chatel and below by Cray Atmosphere. But let me begin with a controversial piece some of you may remember. A couple of years ago, Stephen Bailey, that shy, retiring um, violet, um, wrote in The Spectator uh, in an article called The Spectator Declares War on Bad Public Art. Bailey wrote, Public art is to be enjoyed here at a desolate piazza near you. Has public art ever achieved any level of popular approval or intellectual respect? Um, it's rarely edifying, he said. He goes on, public art is neither wanted much by the public, whoever they might be, nor does it usually pass even the most basic test. Public art is crapola, his words, foisted on the incurious by the cynical and credulous. That's the sort of thing one we expect from The Spectator and perhaps from Stephen Bailey too. But obviously, what we'll be looking at this evening is, is that true? Do we believe Mr. Bailey? Sometimes, as we know, good and bad public art can exist in the same venue. Um, thank you. Yes, not my favourite piece. This is, of course, Paul Day's The Meeting Place of 2007 at St Pancras Station, which Sir Anthony Gormley, to remind you of Anthony Gormley's work, Anthony Gormley called crap. There we are. And may I just compare it with one of my favourite pieces of public art, Martin Jennings's uh, superb Sir John Betjeman um, of uh, 2012. Also, we, we can encounter public art that seems mute, that needs pages of footnotes to be interpreted. Um, just taking one at random, William Rounce's The Frog in Bedford, uh, only installed last year, as the artist says... Um, I've taken my inspiration from Bedford's brick-making history. I've used both the convex mould of the brick and the concave frog of the brick to create a virtual illusion. Different people will see a different perspective, so it will be a talking point. Well, I don't know what you think, but um, 
it's, it's not exactly enlivening, is it? Yet, there are great examples of public art both today and historically in Britain. Rodin's wonderful Burgers of Calais, which he magically transported to the park at Compton Verney. Um, of course, the, the Albert Memorial itself, both the architectural canopy uh, and the wonderful statue inside. And, um, and the wonderful freeze of 1876, um, down to the 1930s, a great time for public art. Here's one of the, um, the, the most famous um, examples of enlightened, enlightened management. Here we are, BBC Broadcasting House. This is, of course, uh, one of Eric Gill's marvellous uh, evocations of Prospero and Ariel of 1932. <coughs> Well, today, as we know, property developers are still occasionally charged with providing a percent for art for public gain. Interesting that in Ireland, a percent for art is still mandatory. Um, and today, public art can still inspire, engage and entertain, whatever Mr Bailey thinks. Wonderful pieces. This is one of my favourites. This is, of course, Katharina Fritsch's Han um, on the 4th Plinth in Trafalgar Square in 2013. Now a permanent exhibit at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. Or indeed, public art can be great, but, but also dangerous. This is, uh, as you all recognise, this is Thomas Heatherwick, his Bee of the Bang in Manchester of 2002, put up for the Commonwealth Games. It's supposed to evoke the idea of a starter's gun. Unfortunately, the spikes kept falling off and threatening to impale passers-by. So now it's been dismantled and put into store. As we'll, I'm sure, all be saying in a minute, public art is perhaps at its best when it relates, it, it, however tenuously, to the site, to the historical urban context in which it sits. Um, sometimes that can be difficult to ascertain. Um, here is Bedford Square. This is Driftwood by the Architectural Association's Unit 2 in 2009. Or indeed, well, equally controversially, at the other end of the spectrum, Andy Scott's Kelpies in the very rural situation, but just outside um, the town of Falkirk of 2013. Or a more organic approach to urban sites, as used by the artist Laura Ellen Bacon here in the Hoban, and here at Compte Verney and at Kent. Or indeed, more recently, uh, a statue that provoked um, a surprising amount of, um, of emotion when it was put up. Um, this is, of course, George Orwell, recently installed right by the BBC, but this is public art. This is not anything to do with the BBC itself. This is financed by a private trust. Um, yeah, interesting to see if, if what your reactions to this sort of installation are. So lots of opinions, lots of debates. Let's see um, how um, we, we interpret public art for the present and the future with our wonderful speakers. And it's my great pleasure first to introduce Sean Henry, who's a, an internationally renowned sculptor, who in recent years has exhibited in galleries and venues as varied as Hamburg, Milan, and most dangerously, perhaps, Salisbury, recently. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, could somebody just help me pull up my slide? Very good. So, uh, I've been told I have ten minutes and I need to address the question. So, the answer to the question is both. Uh, so that's the title. <laughs> you can go now if you want. I think, I think what the title of the debate, though, really is about is uh, the issue of quality control. And so I am very recklessly, as an artist, putting my head above the parapet, briefly, um, to give you some of my thoughts on, on that issue. OK, so there we are. Thank you. So I'm just going to rattle you through a few images of the work that I've done uh, in the urban environment over the last few years. This is a, a figure in um, Stockholm. And it illustrates, if you imagine, that uh, the figure is made of bronze, it's painted. Uh, it's not quite as realistic as it looks when you get up close. You can see that it's made out of clay and then cast and painted. But I like what happened to it when we took it outside um, the gallery in Stockholm. It increases the narrative potential, I suppose, of sculpture uh, in an intriguing way. And I, I uh, put my hand up and say I love putting work in the public realm uh, just from the sheer quantity of reactions and, and the things that happen to it through day and night, winter and summer. Uh, not working. Okay. There we go. Um, 
ignore the halo above him. Actually, can we turn the lights off? Is that possible? Or not? Okay, just a thought. It changes it, you can see, if he's staring at a halo. It's not the same. <laughs> so the, the, the choreography of putting sculpture in the public realm is absolutely crucial. Um, you know, occasionally people ask me, oh, did you have anything to do with you know, where the sculpture went? And I'm usually embarrassed to admit, yep, right down to the last millimetre on every installation. Um, so, I mean, if I get it wrong, then I'm, I'm to blame. This is, uh, I installed, very fortunate, six years ago, I put um, a lot of pieces in Salisbury Cathedral in niches and areas where sculpture would have been historically, would have been taken out often many, many years ago. So that was a unique and, and, and fantastic experience because these pieces just embedded themselves in the building to the extent where people would come in and would confuse and would go, well, it can't be that old, it's got jeans on. You know, what's, what's happening? It was very intriguing. This is in Berkeley Square, uh, an architectural element on that work. And this piece, um, this is at a station in uh, Bad Homburg. I designed the path that she's walking on just to give her a sense of direction. None of the figures I make are life-size. I'm not interested in mimicking life. I think if you try and mimic life, it's generally a, a failure. You know, art has to be an expression of the imagination. And by changing scale, often I make a lot of pieces that are 60% um, life-size, so the sort of golden ratio, 61%. And you have a real empathy with those. You know they can't be real, but you feel something towards them. And similarly, I hope, with these pieces that are uh, larger than life-size, there she is again, a different cast in Colchester High Street, so it couldn't be more different. Um, a Brave, I purchased, I think, from the, the people in Colchester. It's a very lively place. On a Saturday night, people have sat on her shoulders. Um, and one I probably like the most is in Eckeberg Park and in Oslo, uh, which is in a woodland setting. Uh, and recently this popped up on Instagram. Um, and just shows you that sense of the sort of loss of control you have, but, but the, the, the nice things that can happen along the way. How am I doing time-wise? Hang on, I'll just speed up. Okay. Uh, Economist Plaza, a seated man. That was a temporary installation. Uh, seated man, I think I've said this, all the figures are anonymous, so they're not um, of anybody specific which I think helps. So um, I filmed this piece and I can remember a homeless man coming and sitting next to him and go, oh, Jesus, Mary, mother of God. <laughs> and they sat down together and it was just fantastic. I kind of connected with him in his little sleeping bag. Um, I recently had a show at the Lightbox Museum in Woking and the uh, very sympathetic council allowed me to put five pieces running from Woking Station down to the museum. And uh, I fought really hard to get this piece onto Platform 1 at Woking Station, which uh, very near where I grew up, where my father commuted from for many years. And uh, I, I love the um, pathos of, of this chap waiting for a train that's never going to come. And I know it's obvious, and I know, you know, it, I'm sure someone here might criticise me about it in a minute, but, I, but I, I really love this piece here in the rain at night. He's just enduring, and it doesn't really matter what happens to him. I mean, I just happen to spot her, but I've seen other people sitting with it. Some people give him a cigarette, or they mess with it, or whatever. It doesn't really matter. He's just doing something. Outside the station, uh, there was this more controversial spot for a sculpture where I'd seen people selling the big issue, and they, they you know, like all these towns, they say, oh, we have these people coming from outside working who, you know, hang around and drink, and, you know, we're trying to sort that issue out. And, and you know they're actually from Woking and uh, part of Woking. And I remember this bit of Woking hasn't really changed since I was a kid. I can remember being chased by skinheads down that little alleyway in the 1980s. Anyway, so there he is. He's, he's an anonymous figure. And uh, you know, interesting things happen to it. The best of which is somebody actually dosed down next to it for the night. And I wish I'd been there a bit earlier. I might have found him asleep. So... Moving away from me, this is a, another piece in Woking. Uh, I should say they like the figures so much that they bought them all, which is fantastic. So a developer and the council got together and they're now permanent. So those, those three pieces are exactly where I put them and I'm moving two other ones. So that was a great outcome. 
I am interested in the relationship uh, between sculpture and architecture. Obviously, that's why I'm here. This is my own attempt at a, a space with sculptures in it. And it kind of highlights the theatrical nature of sculpture. Now, I know theatrical is a kind of controversial world, but that is what theatre occupies space. I mean, sorry, sculpture occupies space like we do. And so when you place something in an urban setting, it's inherently um, theatrical, I would argue. Um, now, this is an artist called Alex Chinick, uh, who does interesting things with buildings. And I just, uh, I'm just going to show a few bits of public art that I think are thought-provoking, which we might talk about later. Most famous being, obviously, uh, Richard Serra's title, Tilted Art, Tilted Art which people were furious with because it blocked the square. You had to walk around it, and I, it survived there, I think, for eight years, and then was eventually uh, cut into three pieces and taken away. But what I think is interesting about Sarah is he, he's really having a conversation with architecture. You know, I'm with my work. I'm obviously talking about the occupants of Salisbury Cathedral or cities or places, um, whereas he's doing something very different. This can be absolutely taken to Cloudgate in Chicago. Kapoor's very, very famous work which is pretty much perfect I think for our times in that it's called cloud gate it pulls the sky down for once I know Kapoor always claims to pull the sky down into his work but this one actually does it because it's big enough and it brings the city in and then of course in our selfie gener you know selfie culture people see themselves in it they love that kids lie under it they get reflected and you can say it's banal but it isn't really because it's a it's a space age kind of object and it's a very uh, interesting aspect of what we, the problem with public art is that he made another sculpture outside the Olympic Stadium that some of us know that is not as successful. And yet he's got this enormous uh, sense of purpose and isn't really, uh, how can I put this politely, he isn't really edited by anything. Uh, he is Anish Kapoor. And so that's similarly Anthony Gormley, fantastic sculptor. This, I think, is an amazing piece. And it's just called um, Sculpture for Derry Walls. So right in 1987, heart of Northern Ireland, the Troubles, two figures back to back. If you look through the eyes of the sculpture, you can see out of the eyes of the other sculpture an amazingly powerful metaphor for what Belfast was like at the time. You can see there's no graffiti on it. The graffiti's on the wall. You know, everybody understood what this was about and respected it. Then a few years later, we have a, probably a less successful piece in Birmingham. And I know that Anthony wants to reference architecture and humanity. But actually a bound figure, I mean, there's a sort of rift with the arches of the windows, and it's called Iron Man. But I'm not really sure why it's toppling over. Was there a foundry? I don't know what the connection is, other than they can tell, well, we've got a big Gormley. Um, nearly done. This fantastic installation by uh, Anton Kiefer at the Royal Academy, and it's an interesting thing because it's temporary, and a lot of art projects now are temporary. I don't know quite what I feel about that as a maker. I love uh, the idea of trying to produce something permanent, so temporary always. But this was so powerful because these teetering Beirut-type buildings, if you walk into the bottom and look up, that's the image at the bottom, so all the floors were blown out. It was amazingly powerful. And the fact that it was temporary almost made it better, I think. Uh, two more slides. George Siegel's um, fantastic, in my opinion, uh, Holocaust Memorial in San Francisco at the Legion of Honor. Absolutely amazing thing. I can remember it when I was 20. I saw it just last year again. Equally powerful. If it got dirty, graffitied, rain, faded, wouldn't matter. It's just dark and deep and powerful. And you can see just over the wall behind it, there's... Uh, uh, a sculpture I like almost as much by Mark de Subaru that um, it's quite old I think I don't uh, I haven't got the date but painted red it looks like it's still happening if you know what I mean it's just got this energy and power that shoots up into the sky so my, my argument what I'd like to say about public art is that um, see, I'm passionate about it and it, the, the quality control thing which I started with is, is the key and who are the decision makers and that, that is the biggest challenge I think because Private property, private land, private finance. You know, I've had people come up to me and, and, and say, oh, it, it, you're a sculpture. I mean, that's literally how often they've used the word. They don't know I'm a sculptor, not a sculpture. <laughs> and, uh, and they can get terribly excited because their life's quite boring and they can commission an artwork. Oh, I can think about art. You know, 
But why would you allow them to just dive into something without any expertise? You know, I, I, I believe in expertise, you know, the old brain surgery analogy, you know, you want someone good. Okay, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> My great pleasure, thanks so much, Sean, that was brilli a brilliant start. My <coughs> great pleasure to introduce Dr Claire Meluish, who's a, an architectural critic, writer on urbanism, uh, and a curator, and who's very kindly um, come all the way up from London to join us today. Claire. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, just to qualify that, I think I would really describe myself as an anthropologist of the built environment, if you like. Um, but I have a very mixed background, which I will draw on in this presentation, um, working as an architectural critic, writing about public art at certain points, um, and now essentially working in the sort of realm of urbanism in, in the wider sense, and really thinking about how people occupy the city. Um, oh, my presentation isn't up. How do I do that? Um, <coughs> Oh, is it following straight on? Uh, no, it shouldn't be. It's just, it's just for all separate. It's one of those, Claire. Um, that one. That one. The microphone might be hard to look at. Yes. It's a very difficult to hear back. Okay, so. We'll try this one. Is that, is that any better? Sorry, it's not any better. Um, my presentation is... Okay, so this is my stunning announcement, <laughs> my answer to the question, the urban environment is art, um, and this is what I want to talk a bit about um, in my presentation, but it's great to see these examples of some really interesting pieces of public art that Sean's shown us. Um, However, I do want to just describe a bit of the sort of context of some of the public art that has been no, produced. They can't, they can't hear it back. Okay. That has been produced go. over the last kind of 25 years, yeah, really. Um, <coughs> so um, I wanted to start with this kind of statement from Henri Lefebvre, um, great French sociologist and theorist theorist of urban life. The city is an oeuvre, closer to a work of art than to a simple material product. Um, so taking that as my starting point, um, just uh, sort of throwing it into the ring, how do we think about the city in all its aspects as a work of art? And if we're going to think about public art, how do we think about that um, integrated within that context? And how do we sort of be wary of the kind of instrumentalization of art, that public art that has uh, perhaps taken place over the last 25 years? So I just, um, you, I don't know if you can really see this, but this is just um, a, a sort of summary of some of the kind of key bits of uh, legislation that have been produced since the mid, well, since the 1990s, uh, forwarding this idea of public art as a tool in urban regeneration and really sort of putting it into this context whereby we, it can be seen as um, a way of securing or enforcing public consensus and consent through participation in contexts of radical urban transformation, displacement and gentrification. Um, and so really drawing on art's effective agency, uh, its placemaking potential and a whole kind of rhetoric around social cohesion that was really forwarded by the uh, Labour government um, in the first decade of the millennium. And so you can see that going back to the Art Coun Arts Council's publication of 1989, An Urban Renaissance, the role of the arts in urban regeneration, this idea of uh, public art as a medium for promoting uh, radical urban change has been on the agenda. And then this has been developed through um, work by the Comedia Consultancy in the, mid in, in the 1990s, um, City Centres, City Cultures, the role of the arts in the revitalization of towns and cities, work by Charles Landry, I don't know whether you know, 
you're familiar with this kind of um, ar area of work, but the Creative City, uh, published in 1995 and 2000, that then really very much um, Richard Florida's more famous book, perhaps The Rise of the Creative Class in 2002, was really building on these kind of ideas that arts and culture could be used both as a way of instrumentalizing economic uh, revitalization of cities after um, the sort of radical period of industrial decline in the 1980s and the re urban restructuring that went on in many cities across the UK and the States. Um, and that the arts could also be used alongside that kind of process of economic regeneration to pull together communities um, based on a kind of longer standing discourse around community arts practice and generate social cohesion. And this was something that the Labour government really built on uh, with uh, the urban task force that it uh, produced, written by Richard Rogers um, in 1999 that then led into the first urban white paper published since 1978, delivering an urban renaissance in 2000. And then again, uh, making it count the contribution of culture and sport to social inclusion. So again, sort of tracking this kind of slight shift away from um, arts and creativity as a tool of economic regeneration to this kind of uh, more explicit rhetoric around social inclusion as defined by the Labour government. Um, but by 2005, I think um, we can see a certain amount of doubt setting in around whether these um, supposed benefits of arts programs, as summarized by the Joseph Browntree Foundation um, in 1996, were really uh, materializing. So here, the benefits are summarized as enhancing social cohesion and local image, reducing offending behavior, building private public sector partnerships, promoting interest in the local environment, developing self-confidence, enhancing organizational capacity, supporting independence, and exploring visions of the future. So really an awful lot being invested in the arts and culture in, in cities. Um, so in 2004, we have this DCMS consultation document which covered um, cultural icons and landmarks placemaking and urban identity, and community consolidation, which drew attention to the problems that were emerging, um, the problems of making cultural projects relevant to local communities, and how you link up rural regeneration to the urban context, the sheer lack of evidence for the role of culture in strengthening communities and bringing different social groups together, and the lack of methodology for measuring the benefits or added value that culture could bring to delivering key social policy objectives. And by 2010, uh, we've got DCMS's case report, understanding the value of engagement in culture and sport, really sort of reaffirming the, the same conclusions. So acknowledging that you know, the evaluations that have been done were really not adequate, they were short-term, ad hoc, um, often based on quantitative methodologies, and above all, never, never really contained any reference to the quality of art itself. And plus, I think um, there was a sort of dawning realization that um, this, the kind of instrumentalization of artists themselves was problematic in view of artists' kind of traditional and self-selected critical position outside the mainstream economy and society, which meant that th you know, many of them were struggling with this role that they'd been offered in the service of government policy notwithstanding the benefits that these new kind of uh, funding streams were bringing to them. So it was a kind of double-edged sword, um, which was forcing many artists really to examine the artistic and ethical principles of their practice. And then around this time, we can also really see, of course, private developers, um, you know, after the end of the Labour government, the um, incoming coalition government, government strategies in this area kind of falling away and being replaced by um, private development initiatives. Again, kind of using art um, to leverage very large scale urban developments in different contexts and to create this sort of rhetoric around community participation. So I'm just gonna show a few examples and I'm really kind of not going to comment on, you know, whether these works are good or bad, but I think they're illustrative of certain moments in this process. 
So this is um, temporary artworks for Leeds Millennium Square by Pierre Davoine and Deborah Baker, which was developed in 1998-9. And this was very much about drawing the public in to the redevelopment of Leeds, um, well, what is now Leeds Millennium Square, um, now described by, uh, uh, by Leeds City Council as an award-winning city centre outdoor public space and live entertainment venue, um, situated in front of Leeds Civic Hall in the heart of the Civic Quarter and surrounded by some of the city's other most significant and iconic buildings. And this was one of the um, round of millennium projects that were funded at that time, commissioned by Pavilion Women's um, Photography Centre in Leeds and now described as Leeds flagship project to mark the year 2000. Um, this is... Um, a quite famous sculpture by Fernando Botero in Barcelona, his cat. This is um, located in the Rambla de Raval in Barcelona. It was placed there in 2003, having been purchased in 1987 by Barcelona City Council and made its way around different locations in the city until it arrived here. Again, this was a controversial site of urban redevelopment um, at this time and has been used very much as a sort of um, piece of iconic public art that would hopefully kind of bring together the community around it, as well as, of course, forming a tourist attraction. And it's described by the tourist authority um, in the following words, the sculpture has become an integral part of one of Barcelona's most widely redeveloped areas and is a favorite meeting place. Some brave souls even clamber onto the cat's back to have their photos taken. This is um, quite an interesting public art project um, which was uh, commissioned as part of the Northwest Cambridge Development Project. So this is um, a very large project, again, um, being built by Cambridge University to build a new uh, urban precinct, as they describe it, um, in Northwest Cambridge on former Greenbelt land. Um, it was a public, uh, a participatory art project called Tomorrow Today by the artists Nina Pope and Karen Guthrie, um, which took place in 2014 in collaboration with the archaeology department at Cambridge University. And the aim of this, um, well, the whole program of public art commissioning uh, by the Northwest Cambridge uh, Development Project was very much about, again, building a sense of community ownership over this very disruptive, very large-scale urban development, trying to draw people in and create a kind of consensus um, around this process. And so it's described by the Northwest Cambridge um, uh, website as the public art residency outcome um, tomorrow today, when a scale model of the first phase of the development was created with community participants following their residency with the archaeology department. It was also a way of bringing together different departments of the university around this project. Um, and just to continue, the public art program for Northwest Cambridge combines a residency program, commissions, events, and education, all contributing to the life and vibrancy of building a community and enhancing the character for the development. So again, using public art to build up this kind of rhetoric of um, community cohesion and placemaking. And then this um, slide is a mural in Brixton in South London called Nuclear Dawn. This was painted on the side of a building called Carlton Mansions, a residential building in Brixton um, in 1981 by Brian Barnes, Dale McRae and 20 other residents of the building. The funding came from the Arts Council, the Gulbenkian Foundation and the Greater London Arts Association. Um, and an additional £2,000 grant grant for the artist came from Lambeth Council in the form of the Inner City Partnership Fund, which had um, caused great upset to one of Lambeth's Tory councillors who saw it as a great waste of money. Um, so this is quite an old mural. Um, it was opened in 1981 by Hugh Jenkins, the then president for the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament. It seems, again, quite relevant for our time, perhaps. Um, but for other reasons, it has also come back into the public debate because this building, Carlton Mansions, it has been slated for demolition as part of, again, 
um, quite an extensive regeneration of this part of Brixton. And um, just to quote again from the uh, website from the, I think it's the London uh, Mural, Mural Association, aside from its slow decline, its very existence is a threat as the building it sits on and surrounding area will be up for potential development in the near future. A local landmark and powerful piece of community and political history could be lost forever. Most people these days don't see the mural, but when they spot it, they are in awe of the power of the image, its vibrancy and message. It represents our history of a shared experience and a reminder that war is not something we want. Sometimes when we don't have a voice and we can't shout loud enough, the murals speak for us. And so I think this is an example of a piece of public art that really was generated by the community. And as it says there, it has a very particular resonance as um, giving a voice to people in the local neighbourhood who don't normally have a voice in these kind of debates and once again are being threatened with being silenced at the current time as the dispute goes on over whether this mural should be preserved or not. Um, so I just wanted to conclude um, with this image, um, which is not exactly public art, but has also been positioned as art in a certain context. These are large-scale CGI images um, from, uh, again, a very big uh, urban development project in Doha in Qatar, dating from 2012, commissioned by Mushera Properties. And I think these images are quite interesting in the way that they show these images, um, the, these CGI's of the future cities as designed by a number of uh, different architects projected against the backdrop of the existing city on, in this process of very rapid and radical transformation. Um, and they tell a certain story about the future of the city, what Doha, the, uh, the new kind of Doha that will be produced in the future. Um, while at the same time, these particular images really sort of underline the ways in which this narrative excludes, excludes certain members of the community in Doha. So the uh, cleaner, the sweeper that we see on the corner of this um, image and the construction workers here who all belong to non qatari ethnic communities who create the vast majority of the population of Doha, but who are not being uh, referenced in these images, um, this artwork, which again, sort of really um, draws on this kind of, the, the effective capacity that it has to, uh, to, to sort of mobilize a certain kind of emotional energy around this project, to mobilize political resources around it. Um, a, a, a very large project in the city center, which has um, resulted in the uh, displacement of a significant, quite long-standing, again, ethnic, quite cosmopolitan community in Doha. So again, you know, art being used as a double-edged sword, really. Um, so going back to Henri Lefebvre's quote at the beginning, um, this idea of the city itself made up of all of these different aspects, so art, real life, um, all the bits and pieces that make up our experience of the city. Um, uh, sort of really trying to think about how we can evaluate uh, the right to the city as one that's based on rights of appropriation and participation, um, and how then we might think about ways in which the public can engage in actually configuring figur urban space in different ways um, as a creative product of and, and, and the context for their everyday life. Um, and so I want to really conclude by sort of putting forward this idea of an aesthetics of social identity, whereby we think about all of our own everyday activities as part of um, the city as oeuvre. And to understand um, the city as an arena, really, for cultural, social and artistic expression through a whole range of different media and material interfaces, not just uh, commissioned pieces of art, um, that appear in different urban spaces at, at different times. And finally, just to really encourage policymakers to take a step back from the prevailing ideology of the urban environment as a kind of technical milieu, and from this process of 
instrumentalizing art in that context and actively promote all sorts of opportunities for citizens from different backgrounds to participate in and appropriate to urban space through their spontaneous creative and artistic actions. Thank you very much, Claire. My, um, our next speaker is Dr. Kathy Oakes, who's a medievalist, cultural historian, um, and fellow of Kellogg College. Um, well, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And it's uh, wonderfully serendipitous the way we all go away and think about uh, the issues which David presented to us some months ago now and have come back uh, thinking about very, very similar themes. Um, and in my own reflection on you know, the task ahead, I very much wanted to address this question, is art placed in or is it part of the urban environment? And in doing that, I found myself moving around um, a couple of pairs of binaries and one of them is uh, to what extent art should be permanent or temporary, or somewhere between the two, and that's already come up, and also uh, relative visibility. Uh, as a medievalist, I'm very used to art not being necessarily visible. That's not what it was about, but it's a very modern idea, of course, or a post-medieval idea, that art should be seen. And um, perhaps we might think about that, and is that a uh, necessary and essential aspect of it? So, uh, what is art in an urban context, and does this title beg the question whether art has a rightful, expected place in the urban environment, or is it in some sense an outsider, a commentator, sometimes even an unwanted or an unexpected guest? Uh, one might say that traditionally... Our urban art is permanent and visible. It is not like, for instance, uh, this stage design by a very great artist, Hans Holbein the Younger, um, which was made of canvas and wood, inhabited by actors, and enjoying only a few hours on the streets of London as a backdrop to the coronation procession of Anne Boleyn. As a traditional piece of urban art, in other words, permanent uh, and visible, it is certainly visible, but as a traditional piece in that sense, it's arguably rubbish because it's ephemeral. Indeed, like most urban art of the medieval period, which was in the same way theatrical, ephemeral and cleared away after a few hours. And uh, uh, this tendency carried on even into the 16th century, as we can see from this example on the screen behind me. Now, the Romans understood that if urban art is going to fulfil its purpose, and I would suggest that the main purpose of um, urban art is to commemorate, immortalise an event or person, then it has to outlive its subject and be visible. From the Renaissance period on, that has been revived, and urban art has once again become, for the most part, commemorative of an event. In Oxford, the Martyrs' Memorial. In London, Nelson's Column. Uh, a civic ideal. A Michelangelo's David. Or, indeed, a person. Now, this is, and again, this has come up already this evening, this is a particularly good example of traditional urban art in that sense, and in that sense, it is part of, as opposed to placed in, the urban environment. And this is part of the urban, urban environment because, of course, um, the Albert Memorial is famously an integral element from the start of the design of 19th century South Kensington and is, of course, strategically placed in relation to the Albert Hall. In the same way, and much more familiar, well, at least much more local to us, uh, the Martyrs' Memorial is a similar kind of example. It's interesting that the Martyrs' Memorial does not commemorate the place of the martyrdom. It could have been there, but it isn't. It is placed as a beacon, perhaps even an ideological one in the 19th century, at the south end of St Giles, marking the entrance into Oxford from the north, with St Mary Magdalene as its backdrop and originally, of course, unencumbered by bus lanes 
and public lavatories. So permanent, stable, uh, let me lose, lose my place here. Yes, yeah, so permanent, stable, visible, and representative of the status quo of the established order. As such, this urban art is subject, and this is uh, a downside to it, um, as permanent and visible. It is subject not simply to the physical deleterious effects of the passing of time, as all things are, but it is, as part of the urban environment, subject to the changing of value systems and public opinion. Sooner or later, such art becomes a has-been in that respect, and not always, but really quite often, celebrating forgotten personalities or old-fashioned and sometimes even embarrassing causes. So art as, the, as part of the urban environment is arguably counter-art. I mean, shouldn't art question and comment upon the status quo rather than conform with it? Should it not be placed in the urban environment to awaken, startle, surprise, subvert? In order to do this, can it be permanent and need it be visible? Michael, um, oh, I've, Michael Pinsky's work is an example here. Um, and yes, you can see that. This uh, is an installation he did in Paris and um, not so very long ago, within the last seven or eight years. And it was the outcome of a project which trawled the bed of the canal in Paris for rubbish which people had thrown away. Stuff you don't want, you tend to hide. But Pinsky brought it to the surface and then presented it in a new way. So you thought about it differently, perhaps. Perhaps reviewed one's view of rubbish and how it should be treated. He makes the invisible visible. He makes the unwanted desirable. He makes the permeable water impermeable, apparently, by apparently placing objects on it. Now, I think this is great, and I think it would be even greater if you might have come upon it unexpectedly. But of course you didn't. It was very well advertised, and indeed it was only presented to the public um, 12 hours of the day. But I'd like to suggest... I think it's fairly obvious, actually, that the unexpected is powerful, too. And here, urban art placed in the environment perhaps could take its inspiration from 18th century garden design. The picturesque movement, finding a surprise round a corner, something which makes you look twice, return to, something which seems to be in the wrong place. Now, again, I'm going to come to an artist who's already had a bit of an innings tonight, and um, in this case, a local example of his work, because I would suggest that uh, Gormley's Another Time, uh, which is owned by Exeter College, but um, very altruistically placed as a public spectacle of urban art looking over Broad Street, I would suggest that this is an urban picturesque moment. I've walked down there um, so many times. In fact, regularly every year I take a group of students down Broad Street, many of them pretty familiar with Oxford, and pointed out. And it's such a delight that many people have never noticed it before. Um, and they're delighted too to suddenly see something um, afresh. It's, uh, it's intriguing that they think that they've never seen it before. It's much more exciting to discover something which looks as if it's trying to be hidden or to have something pointed out in a place you thought was so familiar to you. Well, I hope very much that Gormley's work is permanent. I don't think it falls into the ephemeral category, which I also think is a good idea for urban art. But where I think this is interesting is in terms of its vis visibility. It's not, obviously, 
extremely visible. Um, it doesn't stand in the middle of your sight lines as you walk down through Oxford. It's not even conventionally situated. And therefore, it's provocative of varied and rapidly changing responses. You see it and you're surprised. You're anxious. Is this a suicide case? No, it's not. Therefore, you're bewildered. And then you begin to wonder what on earth it's all about. And those are rapid changes and very exciting changes in response to such an object. And indeed, the title given to it suggests it does not aspire to be subject to the passage of time. Um, Another time is the title. So in that respect, it is not of the urban environment. It's not there and the urban environment placed around it in any kind of permanent kind of way. And its position, too, is neutral. I think you could imagine this particular Gormley popping up anywhere on the Oxford skyline. It doesn't need to be above that Blackwell's is it poster shop now. Gormley's piece is featureless, is featureless though recognisably human. It therefore has the potential to be both transcendent and familiar. It can work in its setting with the response of each individual viewer becoming a different work of urban art as each and every encounter. And um, my own point of view, I put it forward tonight as something which I think is exemplary as a piece of urban art placed as it should be in the urban environment. Thank you. Delighted to introduce Dr. Leon Wainwright, who's an Oxford-based and internationally renowned art historian, whose most recent book um, was Phenomenal Difference, published last year, A Philosophy of Black British Art. And that's Okay, well, thank great. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. So um, that was kind of useful for me, actually, because I've been able to show you a little bit of video, which I didn't think I'd have time to do. So I've managed to grab some seconds there, which is useful. Um, my approach uh, today really will be to suggest that the production of urban identities through art can bring quite mixed results that don't always result uh, or bring benefits to the artist or artists. And that might seem like a, quite a controversial uh, idea, but the, in particular the projection of a multi-ethnic or multicultural urban identity, which could involve uh, public exhibitions and events with artists from marginal, marginalised or excluded communities, drawn from the city itself or drawn from further afield. Uh, that kind of practice has often seen the very same communities being misrepresented and in my uh, research, I found that many of those artists and communities are even exploited in the process. So I'm going to try and enlarge a little bit on that. The real question then that sort of follows on the back of that is why do artists participate at all? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, and I think answering it takes or should take in-depth academic research that involves listening to the experiences of artists and those that work with them, curators, public arts programmers, arts policy makers. But more than that, I think it's essential that we consider the question as a problem for urban studies, for uh, knowledge exchange, uh, and also for sustainability. And so just kind of commenting on this, what I want to do very briefly is draw from two case studies that connect city spaces uh, in Europe. Those two spaces are Manchester and Rotterdam, not connected to each other, um, in, in the example, but uh, in, uh, at a sort of meta level, I suppose. And uh, the Car- uh, context in the Caribbean, in this case, uh, Paramaribo in, the, in, the, um, in Suriname, uh, as well as Asia. And what I'll try to do sort of very briefly is bring these multiple sites into a sort of um, tight focus in relation to the debate, these debates that we've been having on art and place uh, and space. I mean, in particular, Claire uh, Mel Hewish, having raised um, the, uh, the topic of the rhetoric of place and the development of place, um, is uh, something I'm going to enlarge on um, if I can here. 
Okay, technology permitting. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, Claire, when you were talking just now about this rhetoric of place and placemaking, um, that provides a brilliant cue into my first sort of case study. Uh, Sir Richard Leese, when he was leader of Manchester City Council, extolled the virtues of Manchester, or more precisely the kind of wider regional conurbation which, um, which Leese served, and its hopeful future in quite characteristic fashion. I'm going to quote him. He said, an innovative spirit runs through Manchester's modern history and we're on the way to becoming a truly smart city region. Our great, greater Manchester strategy sets out an ambitious vision for the city region by 2020. These notions of a kind of independently, even ingeniously smart city go hand in hand with the expectation that cities like Manchester should enjoy long-term economic growth by maintaining several things, the pace of urban regeneration, improving the city's transport infrastructure and ensuring its impact on the wider region. The strategy uh, in this case is to embrace digital technologies and a low carbon footprint while ensuring that there are amenities for older generations of the city's inhabitants, which suggests a kind of balancing act with all this kind of upbeat rhetoric on innovation and change. If those goals seem identical to the ones shared by most city planners around the world, which I think they do, what makes Manchester's priorities apparently so smart is the style in which it pursues them. It, it seems to me it kind of seeks uh, hard results by indirection, above all by putting greater uh, emphasis on creativity. Uh, the city um, sets out to deliver its development aims, and we've heard uh, very well there in that summary from Claire about this rhetoric of community cohesion uh, and participation. Let me then turn to an example of an artist who has made work in Manchester and about Manchester, um, and that would be uh, an artist from Korea. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bum, by the name of June Bum Park. The hands in this um, brief video are kind of decorating the photograph of an empty building in Manchester. What you're seeing essentially is signboards quickly finding their way onto windowsills and doorways of a brick-built corner in the city centre. The collage is almost full and its meaning is quite clear. There's more rental space than tenants and more signage than windows. In a sense, this is urbanism at its worst. The results are kind of loud, they're vibrant, they're attention-grabbing, but at the same time they heave with desperation. Uh, Park's work is, of art is in wry dedication to cities in financial crisis. I wonder if it offers a kind of local picture of a condition that repeats the world over. Let me just flick back here. There we are. In fact, I mean, proclamations about Manchester's future as a global city have never been far from the enthusiasm that was shown towards a major contemporary art program that I was involved with named the, the Asia Triennial Manchester, which was first staged in 2008. Uh, the acronym is ATM. Uh, June Park, uh, June Bon Park participated in that in 2011. And indeed, the ATM for me has provided a kind of case study of how the visual arts have occupied and navigated that space between enthusiasm about urban development and then this kind of more sober illustration of the life of cities that we've seen there um, from in Park's artwork. The first Asia Triennial Manchester in 2008 was a research project. It was actually conceived sort of in partnership with a university, with Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, and it was realised through an extensive consultation process with Manchester's key museum and gallery cur uh, curators, along with contemporary artists from Asia and the Asian diaspora. Through collaborative research with partner venues, the ATM then aimed to develop a long-term programme of international exhibitions and residencies by contemporary Asian artists that can create opportunities for Western audiences to view significant cultural phenomena from Asia and its diaspora. In other words, it was founded on these principles of, kind of knowledge exchange and partnership, and it went out to commission world-standing artists and forge links between uh, public and third sector organisations across multiple venues, uh, seeking out previously unused sites for cultural events. It's fostered 
collaborative networks amongst all kinds of people, academics, artists, curators, and policymakers, culminating at intervals of three years, located primarily in the city of Manchester. It's called a triennial, but of course it follows the model of a biennial, the very model that has been criticised for its kind of unapologetic endorsement of a number of uh, uh, approaches to the urban neoliberal and post-Fordist production styles, namely. Less, in this case, is the artwork akin to a commodity or the artist even to a kind of labourer than that the media... Uh, the, the biennial event itself becomes the commodity. And I think that's what we saw in the case of the ATM. It's not unusual in that res respect, in that um, it's the immaterial labor forces um, offered by the artist and financed by corporate sponsors and the local council and other bodies, um, if you like, um, uh, epitomized for us the workings of the neoliberal state in its relationship with uh, ideas about creativity uh, and art in, in public spaces. It's sometimes easy to become carried away with the promised yield and the, the sig signified associations of the biennial brand. And to focus entirely on the aesthetics, relational or otherwise, of the biennial's artworks, I'd suggest risks forgetting that they are part of a more global phenomenon, the rise of a creative mega-event. But I come back to that question why do artists participate at all in this? What are we to understand of the contradiction between the objectives of uh, event organisers and sponsors for uh, festivals like the ATM and the interests of artists who are attached to these events? There's evidently a conflict between an artist's desire to engage with the brand of an event such as this, but also to be creatively autonomous from it. If artists wish to showcase themselves to the world, what other choice then is there beyond the contemporary kind of cultural and economic structure of things like art biennials between these new alignments of art and urbanism? Well, I'm going to try and sort of answer that by zipping across to this example from the Netherlands in its relationship with a former Dutch colony um, in the Caribbean. Can you see that all right? Um, Suriname, which achieved independence from the Netherlands in 1975. When art is positioned by a discourse of urban inclusion and exchange, where it's expected to perform the social and political work of race relations transposed to the cultural field, I wonder, is it placed somewhere behind or at a remove, or segregated even, from the central preoccupations and values that surround cultural creativity and have done historically? What might, why might it be misleading then to regard the kind of art that you see in these urban contexts as a reliable barometer of the developing climate of global urban interconnectedness? And I know this is kind of a big issue, but I'm going to try and just kind of cover it in a thumbnail sketch. Well, a running thread in this debate is the matter of the degree of choice presented to artists of the global south. Um, and that's one of the things I was trying to understand um, when I looked at um, um, this, uh, an art program that connected uh, in the year 2010 the Netherlands and Suriname, um, it was a four year cultural program entitled Art Ropa. Um, you can, I'm, I'm just trying to remind us of the, the geography of uh, South America so you can see where Suriname, Suriname is there on the north coast of South America. This, is the, this was the logo for Art Ropa. The Ro is from Rotterdam, and the PA is from Paramaribo, the capital city of Suriname. It linked those two cities, and it linked their two art communities. The final phase of the program happened, in fact, in the Netherlands. So the, the program, for the most part, took place over in the Caribbean, and then it's kind of culminated in an exhibition at the, towards the end of 2010 in Rotterdam. And I went to both places and talked to people in each case. What I did in the course of this work is explored, I tried to explore an interest in the geographical dimensions of mobility. And I saw here the opportunity to trace the movement or the transfer of this exhibition, this program and its aims from the Caribbean to the Netherlands in order to assess how they underwent a kind of transition along the way, as well as to gain a clear understanding of the experience of artists themselves 
as they participated in the program. Now, I'm not going to give you the kind of ethnography of this, but in Precy, I think what I took away from this work was the need to handle quite critically any proclamation about this program being exemplary of free or global movement, being driven by the desire to expand and enrich the field of art through engaging in a kind of global exchange in urban space. That rhetoric tends to expound on the virtues of free movement through space. There's very little of that being represented in, in this context. And for cities like Rotterdam, um, well, that rhetoric uh, very much serves this notion of the city as a global city, as a city that foregrounds kind of public representations of, of art and culture from elsewhere. And in doing so, it kind of produces a sense of place and a sense of identity for the city. The demand for creative labor to help create such conditions for growth and regeneration, in this case, led to Paramaribo, as suggested in the icon of this, you know, this, this um, suspension bridge linking the two places. When I was in Suriname and I talked to people there about how they, they, they felt um, the program had gone, essentially what they told me is that the, the very aim to kind of stimulate creativity and diversity and to establish cultural infrastructure had been neglected, if not ac actively kind of subverted in various ways through the program. Most notable is that the path of movement between the two cities took mainly one direction. Uh, the journalist Chandra von Binnendijk reported from Paramaribo, I'll just read what she says, that the recent exchange programs are a sensitive issue in the art scene. There's considerable dissatisfaction with the content of the agreements and rumbles of discontent can be heard. Far fewer Surinamese students or artists go to the Netherlands than vice versa. So what we have is kind of unequal flows between two countries that help, um, in this case, to create a situation of precariousness for Caribbean artists who were then doubly sort of disadvantaged as non-nationals by participating in the conditions of casual or freelance labor that underpins uh, Rotterdam's cultural industries. And through the exploitation of Caribbean artists as, as human capital, I suppose I should show you some of the images from, from the, the program, I'll sort of let them roll. These artists, I think, were denied what the geographer David Harvey has called a right to the city, the right to benefit from the metropolitan art environment of Rotterdam in which they lent their labor. And above all, they, they seem to have lost their kind of right to the city of Paramaribo. In other words, the right to determine the direction of development for its art and its art community, free from external interference. And sort of my over, overall sense of this is that Suriname's relative deficit of global power and cultural capital became more precarious and a kind of funding and policy vacuum that Dutch money and its bureaucratic priorities sort of rushed in to fill. And what's really striking about all of this is um, sort of like where do artworks factor and the meaning of works of art factor uh, in all this. And I just kind of want to show you a sort of summary slide um, which suggests for me that artworks themselves included in these exhibitions actively questioned the underlying processes and purposes for the entire program. So for, for instance, the artist George Stroikelblok chose to put at the center of the meaning of his works um, the limitations of space and the resources for chicks. He, he made a work about chicks. Where is it? There at the bottom. Um, he problematized ideas of growth. Um, and he also looked at um, the aspirations of children who are living in, um, in homes in Suriname to travel to the Netherlands and looked at their aspirations to move to the Caribbean and kind of the obstacles really um, to, to that, to, for them. Ramasurdi, another artist, highlighted why his works were best, actually best, virtue, uh, best viewed in situ in the Caribbean. He was, th there's an artist who kind of suggests that basically you shouldn't be taking the work out of the country at all and showing it in the metropolitan North Atlantic centers um, because it uh, throws up all sorts of problems about the adequacy of those audiences to grasp the contextual and the critical depth of much Caribbean art. In a sense, it seems to me that these artists were tackling the problems and the pressures of mobility by looking at the path of movement across the Atlantic between cities 
of uh, the cities of Paramaribo and Rotterdam as individuals who themselves have kind of shuttled back and forth between global metropole and global periphery throughout their art education and careers. And I found when I was talking to artists involved in these programs that they really felt very uncomfortable about, about the, the, their involvement. The attendant discomfort, the actual mistreatment that these artists told me about would become integral to their decisions about how to participate in these kinds of art uh, programs to and what works of art to produce. Thanks very much. And um, ba yeah, basically, you can see where I'm going with this, but I, I'm kind of catching on the tail of what we would heard about a moment ago, which is this, this sort of push back against these top-down policies of placemaking in which the arts were instrumentalized, as, as Claire um, Mel Hewish put it, and how artists then find themselves having to reflect on their own involvement and, and think about the traditional role as, um, um, as you're suggesting, as uh, offering a critique on uh, establishment norms uh, and, 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 and dominant outlooks, um, but also involving themselves in reflecting on questions of ethics and, and ethical principles. Um, let me kind of come to a conclusion on this. I mean, I think we need to know more consequently about how art is being used or produced to satisfy the demand for urban exchange and urban interconnection, but more specifically, um, how it's being used or instrumentalized to satisfy the demand for mobility. And crucially, I think we should ask how the kind of normativity of such a demand for mobility comes not only to produce art, but to actively produce artists. It kind of transforms artists into materials th that they themselves can be mediated or made to travel between different urban spaces. I've seen plenty of examples of this. I think that would press, thinking al along those lines would press the Harvey, David Harvey kind of theorization and its politics an important stage further. But it would also inflect productively on the question raised by today's meeting. Is art placed in or of the urban environment? The operative word they're being placed in Mo Manchester and Rotterdam. The urban space produced not only art, but artists at the same time placing them here uh, and, in a sense, creating value by attention to their ostensible origins elsewhere. So there's always a kind of spatializing element with this. But the frictions of their movement from one urban environment to another were necessarily glossed over in the name of openness creativity, inclusion, uh, co community cohesion, for instance. Art's placement within the art environment, then, is above all, I would say, a contingent discursive practice in which the value and meaning of artworks and artists is both determined but also negotiated, and there are always winners and losers in the process. And that's all I've got to say on it. Thank you. Thank you.